I'm a, a blend of a computer scientist and organic chemist. And um, I, I work right now in, in force field development, and I'll explain that uh, during this presentation. Um, and for the last 12 years, I've been in Python. Uh, I started off in like early Python 2.3, and I decided to use Python for this project to, and you'll see how I kind of wrap my, my head around this and, and getting something off the ground. Um, so I wanted to start off very, very simplistically. Uh, there's this molecule on the left-hand side here. Um, does anyone know what this molecule is called? If you had to say the English, or sorry, I just uh, don't know. Um, yeah, let, let me know once you've got that shared again, and I'll bring the screen up. Sure. Uh, this thing. Yeah, I'll monitor the comments, so don't worry about it. Just you can just oh, share okay. your full screen. Yeah. Sorry. Um, okay. So. Uh, did anyone have a response? Or maybe they saw it. Um, a lot of people call this uh, azorbic acid. And like a lot of scientists know what this is used in the common. Um, when you're in the field, you, you know what this name is, and you know how to use it and apply it. But the common general people, it doesn't really ring a bell. Uh, so if I was talking about azorbic acid to someone that works in like a marketing thing, they, they have no clue. But if I change the name into what people regularly call it, which is vitamin C, uh, it rings a bell to everyone. And so, um, but there exists now two names for the same chemical compound. One that is more easily recognized from one group of people and one that's recognized for a very subset. So there's like a general and then there's also a very subset community. Um, and in the 1980s, uh, when you try to record these chemical compounds into the computer, it wasn't very intuitive in how to actually record something like this into the computer and actually like, create a database. And so uh, this language of SMILES was developed, which is a 1D language to kind of represent and condense down this information into a 1D string. And, uh, the language was developed as an organic chemist to be intuitively to just write this on their keyboard into the computer. So rather than draw the molecule, you can just write the string directly. Um, so what I did is uh, I studied smiles for, for a long time. And um, <clears throat> as I started to uh, analyze databases, I realized I needed a reference index for all these different types of functional groups that are actually useful to people. Um, and for me, uh, a lot of the chemicals that are in my daily life is what I read off of the ingredients for, for anything, really. Um, and so I figured that'd be a good starting point for keeping a reference index. Uh, and so that's, that's what I did. And so, um, the, the thing is, is that um, there's a lot of different types of chemicals in the world. And uh, for me, I, I don't know what all of them are. And so if I wanted to expand and look into chemical infinity and chemical space, I needed to have a good reference index, um, but very diverse. Uh, and for me, right, as an organic chemist, I'm, I'm siloed into what I know. And so I needed to expand that out. And so I started reaching out to a lot of my scientist friends or engineers, or even just like the regular people in my daily life um, <clears throat> about what chemicals they, they have in, in their life and what do they use. And I can use this as like an index. Um, and so a couple of examples that I, I kind of hit is like uh, in the top left here, I've got the interstellar space. So these are all the common molecules found in space. Um, the language is very old, and so they've got some like very weird rules to how that language is can kind of constructed or how they label the molecules. And even then, the molecules are, are very weird in space. Uh, there's a very popular um, recreational drug, cannabis sativa. So um, if you go to like the medical dispensary, you'll see on the back of the package there's like 11 terpenes. But for me, um, I've gone through the 6,000 years 
with history with uh, Carlton Turner's paper. And then I have 425 ingredients of cannabis sentiva and 101 terpenes in my list. And so I have this index for what's, what's in there. Um, I, over here and on the left hand side, I, I really started pushing this into like you, you have the, the Russian Ukrainian war and you have nerve toxic agents developed during the cold war from the Russians. And so, um, but it's not clear in what nerve toxic agents are being used to kill or what they use to approve. So I've gone through the books of like Honig or Dr. Mirzanov's account when they defected and the chemical groups that were in there, I've recorded it. So that now we have this index too of what toxic agents. Um, I have a lot of uh, female coworkers and they, they complain a lot about birth control. So I always hear about birth control a lot. Um, and so uh, one of the problems they have is when they keep switching birth control and the excipients used in those, in those drugs and what they're allergic to or, or things that kind of like mess around with their hormones. So I started recording like, what molecules are used in these oral contraceptives and then how do these people kind of respond to it and similarly with narcotics too so um these lists became very expansive and i, I recorded around 3500 in there so now we have this reference index so i needed to organize all this data that was kind of coming in and um to be honest i, I, I didn't exactly know how but python was something i was uh, that's what I was taught data structures in. So I was kind of uh, going back to some familiarity there. Um, the root node I kind of set is global chem. So I, I just set up a very like basic node architecture structure where you have like all your different types of nodes and each node um, is essentially like for, for the first one, let's say narcotics. So uh, in the USA, they've got a list of five scheduled um, lists of narcotics and varying their degree of um, severity. And Schedule 1 is kind of like the, the hardcore, like, okay, these drugs should not be on the market. So uh, what I did is I wrote the Python object Schedule 1, and inside I wrote the list of smiles and uh, the common chemical name, or how they report it. Uh, and so each node is its resource and inside the, the the methods for each node are essentially get the smiles and another language get the smarts which is a rejects pattern matching um, and so I organized it kind of like this this directory structure and you, you'll see it if you go inside the code um, later on <clears throat> and this is uh, where I'm trying to like abstract the classifications of these molecules so like uh, Icana came up with its own basic root of like food, cannabis, sexual wellness, war, narcotics. There's more in there, like your skin and uh, environment materials, and, it, and the list goes on. Um, and then I distributed this. So I made it PIP installable, and people can access the network or use this data however they see fit. And so over the last year or so, it's been climbing at 160K thousand downloads. And then still on its own rate and kind of living a little bit on its own for a bit. Um, so for me though, uh, I wanted to do a little bit more understanding. So a little bit of a different, of kind of like a pseudoscience aspect of what I could do with this data. Um, and so this is where we're gonna uh, change a little bit into understanding what a molecule really is. Um, so. Uh, you take you take a molecule and you can abstract it out into certain features and features that describe like the, mo the molecular geometry and how it behaves to other molecules around it. Um, <clears throat> so uh, in the world of uh, quantum chemistry and molecular mechanics, there is um, what they do is they basically uh, predict geometry using quantum mechanics and they match the quantum to um, using a molecular mechanics model and then using some parameters to kind of define like okay these are the these are the numbers to record like how this molecule behaves and there's a lot of different types of equations in life and for now I'm, I'm married to this one uh, so this is the charm uh, equation and you can kind of see here that the 
uh, the molecule can be abstracted out into seven different features. Um, the bonds, meaning this is the um, <clears throat> this is uh, describing the the force constant and the distance between two atoms. The angle, which is the angle between three atoms. The dihedral, which is the angle between this atom and that one, and it's like three D space as it's rotating. The improper is like when something is bent out of its plane, and it's the torsion when it's bent out of its plane. Um, Euraria badly is a uh, when you have a three atom system, and then the one to three interactions between them as they kind of collide, you kind of put like a pseudo bond. Coulombic is point charges between the atoms, and the Leonard Jones, which is um, my thesis, and uh, which is kind of describing the van der Waals, uh, or it's been shown to kind of describe the van der Waals, which is your repulsive and attraction forces, uh, repulsion, your 12 and your six. So I read my thesis if you're interested in Leonard Jones. Um, so I kind of want to describe like what, what that means. So like, let's, let's take a bond and how, how do we actually record this into the computer? Um, so let's look at the theory and then let's apply it into the computer. Uh, you have a methyl carbon here and let's say you have a oxygen, so an alcohol here. They both have a hydrogen. So hydrogen is a base category and we all understand that is, but these hydrogens are attached to different heteroatoms, an oxygen and a carbon, which, uh, and they're different types because they're in different environments. And this environment I'm trying to show is like, for a, for a, <clears throat> for a methyl car, uh, hydrogen, uh, it kind of protrudes out of the radius of the carbon here. And so this, this hydrogen actually sticks a little bit out. Whereas like a polar hydrogen, like this, this one with this oxygen, sits inside of the oxygen radius at 0.22 angstroms. So they're, they're very different in terms of like where that hydrogen is and how accessible it is to something else. And we record this as saying that like, okay, for this carbon and this hydrogen, we record this as CG331, which is our nomenclature for kind of describing what this atom type is with this this type of hydrogen, HGA3. Um, and then we record this polar hydrogen as like one polar group hydrogen. And then this one is the three aliphatic group hydrogen. Um, <clears throat> and we recorded around roughly 158 atom types across a lot of different elements. And so our atom type engine, from what I know, is the largest in the world. Um, so now that we have this atom type engine, we have a way to describe this type of stuff. Uh, we can kind of get more acute information of understanding molecules in larger sets. Um, so what I did is, uh, um, our, our dictionary that we wrote is written in smiles. And I needed to process it through that software to predict these parameters for what um, they are and kind of look at the performance of our force field. And so to do that, I had to take a small string and convert it into our language. And so uh, in another talk, maybe I'll, I'll go into this because it's a little bit more advanced, is um, building this in Python and then having this workflow where I basically take large sets of uh, small strings, and then I pass it through our C++ code, and then I get back out um, the atom types, and then all their different parameters. And then I abstract that into a database. Uh, the, the force field that we have, so we recorded 158 atom types. And if those atom types are not like if we have a molecule that we haven't seen before and we need to predict new atom types for it, we kind of have a penalty score where we kind of like, okay, um, we can estimate new parameters for this molecule based on how similar it is to something else. And the penalty score is attributed to how different something is 
and where these parameters were abstracted from. So we can actually use that penalty score to start exploring chemical space because if we have a reference index for what we've seen before, we can start looking for things that we haven't. Um, and that's what I did. So uh, I looked into the chemical universe a bit and I needed to find a molecule to parameterize, which is what we do in our group. Um, <clears throat> and so I placed the, <clears throat> I put all the molecules through and then I took the probability distribution of those molecules with a penalty score on the x-axis. On the y-axis, you can kind of see like, okay, these are around 750 molecules here are kind of having a penalty score of zero, which meaning that we've seen these all before and we have parameters for that. Um, the rare ones, as we kind of move past 100, and the score goes up to infinity, so there was no barrier there. Uh, the, you can start to pick up patterns that you haven't seen before. Um, this pattern right here is called a diphyline, and I haven't actually seen that before because uh, this ring system is, is, is new to me. So I've looked at a lot of different types of drugs and chemicals, and this is kind of what we do when we design, we look at new fragments. Uh, someone also tattooed to my arm. Um, <clears throat> so then I wanted to, to kind of expand this into something a little bit more uh, pseudoscience-y for, for fun aspect. Uh, and the reason being was to, to kind of help its marketing ploy because, um, you know, I feel like when you have a lot of this data, it's, it's very hard to, to visualize and plot like exactly what's going on. But you can also start to do some more fun things when you have this data. Uh, so I wrote this kind of like um, workflow in Python with D3 to get this this core diagram. And how this core diagram works, uh, or this particular one, is that all the atom type languages, or all, the, all our atom types that are from the global chem common universe, is a node here on the graph. And then each uh, point, so each color represents a different type of bond, or not bond, um, relationship between the atom type. So if this atom type exists, with another one. So I just wanted to check their presence and how frequent two different atom types kind of show up together. Uh, so what I did here is then I looked at the count of how much two atom types exist. And then that kind of correlates to the thickness of the line. And when you look at this, when you follow this plot, you can kind of see this HGA1 and this HGA5 following the pink. I was looking at this for a long time. Um, the, the alkene proton is HGA5, and HGA1 is a hydrogen sitting off of the um, carbon. So the, or an aliphatic carbon. So we can kind of like start to abstract like a very basic question that like, okay, maybe alkenes are very common, alkanes are very common, which we already know, but we start to kind of like, as we sample more of the universe, we can pick up on atom types that are more common that show up and start looking at different atom types that maybe are not. So it, it helps us kind of start exploring some things. Um, a more, so I, I wanted to start really expanding this workflow into something bigger and bigger because uh, there is a data set called the Enamine database, which sits at around, 22 billion right now and they're expanding their small string so it's written in smalls and it has their they're getting up to about a billion per month uh, with the whole russian ukrainian war war they've kind of paused because their servers have gone down a bit um so i needed to expand my workflow into handling larger and larger sets of data and so the first step is like okay can i tack on a million molecules and pass it through our force field and then start looking at uh, more um, bond relationships. So what are the most common bonds? Uh, and so I pushed one million molecules through and I looked at just the bonds. So not like if they exist with each other, but how frequently those type of show up. And when I was looking at this plot, I could kind of 
change the curvature and kind of come up with a relationship to see where the density of like some certain like atom types would be. And I was looking at this and I could see that the CG2R62 and the CG2R67. So these kind of showed like directly within this, this density here. And these two are like a benzene carbon and an azaline bridge carbon. So something like right here. Um, azaline complexes I've seen more and more showing up as a common ring fragment. If you look at the rings and drugs paper with, um, and rings and drugs are the common ring systems that pass FDA phase three trials. Uh, azaline shows up more and more because it's a trending molecule. And so it's something that I kind of keep in the background as well, that like maybe I might need to use an azaline complex. Um, so then this project grew in its own way. So as I, as I started expanding more into just um, plotting things and then showcasing it to people and um, kind of just working through my thesis here, uh, I, I was expanding out into a lot of different social media platforms. Um, Hacker News, Indie Hackers, and, and Reddit was my primary, primary one. Um, those plots received a lot of general attention because people could just play around with it. So that's what kind of gained some more traction. Um, the, the idea was that the chemical list can come from anywhere and can be backed by anyone that's like within their own community, um, providing information to me so I can write the molecules to them. And so initially it started off with just a network of graduate students that I found through Twitter. And so um, through like five or six different universities around the world, we, I just taught smiles to people and we, we've been writing. Um, postdocs from different universities and my own have like helped contribute in guidance of the development. And then I have, you know, some undergrads and I have people with no degrees. So people that have just reached out that are like, okay, I have, I work in landscaping and these are the chemicals I use for that, or this is what I, um, I work in hairstyling or um, that type of stuff. So yeah, I think one of the popular ones was like nail polish and hairstyling and, and, and that stuff. Um, and I needed to also establish this in such a way that it was like building kind of a community. So more and more people were reaching out and I needed this to, to, like as more and more data was coming in and I, I didn't have enough time to kind of like work through everything, uh, I just realized I needed to establish this kind of like body to, to oversee this. So we were, we're kind of uh, establishing this, this nonprofit and it's just through like <clears throat> keeping this data uh, open and free. So, and we as the people kind of like help govern what that data is and how to help regulate this dictionary. Uh, I, with the GitHub repo, I backed it with the whole Gitcoin grant, which means I could just funnel the, the money into the repo. So I'm still kind of working through what that means, but I don't exactly know the, the workings of that. Um, but what is next? So the, the idea is that um, there, there's so many different types of rules for each list. So there was rules for materials, rules for environment, rules for how people came up with like, um, just even talking about vitamins. So like, I, I realized as I was trying to write my own rule book, it was getting kind of crazy. So what I started doing is I was just building a seek to seek model of undefined rules and coming up with kind of this general, um, maybe, seek to seek model that could kind of like do the prediction of the common chemical name to the smiles or back again. Uh, and so I'm still kind of working through that. And that's the project that I'm hoping to kind of complete next year. Uh, more folk are, have been joining and, and backing the projects. There was a, an MPL license, a Mozilla public license attached to it. And I, I won't get into the legality of that, but um, it, it has been cool because the data could come also from academia or industry and people that use this data for their own companies or something. Um, it's just built on some transparency. So everyone's using this and then um, kind of help partner or support it. And so one of the, 
recent reports we got is the spot coin cryptocurrency for backing on the on the cannabis list, which is very relevant to them. Um, so the project's grown a lot, and you know I've met a lot of wonderful people that I didn't think I would meet before, and they've they taught me a lot about. <clears throat> different stuff and so I feel like a lot of my science has matured uh, to get to this point so the last thing I, I do want to leave you with is I have a demo here and then I change the the language at the top to something that's more intuitive to a chemist or someone that's like basic so like you wouldn't have to know our language and you can kind of look at this and follow the lines yourself um, and read the different types of nodes that should be kind of easier for you. Don't know where to, maybe I'll send it to Sean. I've, I've edited the chat so the, our audience members can actually click on that link and then follow to that. Cool. Um, and that is it. If anyone would like to ask any questions. Great. Well, th thank you so much, Sal, for the very nice talk. I, I, I like to see uh, it's a very novel and very fruitful endeavor to try and map out a navigable space of knowledge graph for chemicals, right? Yeah. Excellent. Um, so there are a couple of questions in chat. I'll just pick one out first. Uh, uh, all right. The first question would be, um, uh, I'll start with Dario's. Uh, Dario is asking, are certain molecules duplicated in different lists? If so, can you look up in which lists it is or industry it is used when you know the name? So you're asking, are different molecules recorded differently in different lists, right? Oh, wait. Yeah, so um, uh, I have a partner on this, or she's helped curating me as Bettina, and she has decided um, she wants to standardize that part. Um, we we originally kind of kept it as like uh, as like okay, how it's recorded is how we'll how we'll keep it. And there's functionality built into the code. So when you fetch like a molecule, um, you can see like like if you fetch it by smiles, you can see which nodes it comes from and then which list it corresponds to. But for the actual standardization, we still haven't decided that yet. Um, mm -hmm. But there is functionality for getting that information built into the code. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. OK, interesting. Well, thanks thanks for that answer. Um, it's another question which uh, I, think, I think is quite, quite hilarious. So I'll just bring it up on screen again. So Steven, Steven's asking, so, so would your research help in designing something like a super weed? Yeah, so that's actually in the, the works, because the, the cannabis industry, um, now has a reference index and so like uh basically you can do like fingerprinting and you can start predicting new different thc compounds based on that and then like playing around with it the the thing is is uh is the chemical composition from the phenotype which needs to be regulated um and that has a lot of effect so on on different users uh, mo more than people think. So, yeah, I feel like if you know the chemical composition plus the terpenes, then yeah, you could do what you need to do.